Hello, everybody. Hello, YouTube. Hello, art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with yet another video. This time, uh, I don't even know what this video is really going to be about. Let's just put it that way. Uh, it's going to end up being about something. I'm just not sure what at this very point right now. Okay. Uh, it's going to be Shining related. It's going to be Kubrick related. It's going to be film analysis related. It's going to be art history related. It's going to be art related. Something. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess you'll, you'll see. You'll see when I do what this video is going to be about. Uh, I know it's the beginning of something else. How about that? Um, I am working on Boxy, if you're listening. I'm working on my next installment of Understanding the Shining part. What is it? Come on. Part 17. Okay, so I'm working on that. That'll be coming in the next couple of days, I think. Um, but I want to do some interesting videos or th things that I I've, I've been kind of thinking about turning over in my head lately. Um that's the wonderful thing about Stanley Kubrick's films. They are learning experiences because if you're like me and I know a lot of you are, it prompts you to research other things, to think about other things. This is what education should be like in my opinion. Um so anyway, let me do the church announcements first, and then let's get into whatever it is that I'm going to get into. I'm not sure myself. Uh, so, returning viewers, thank you for returning. So, uh, New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. All 548 of you, okay, um, I appreciate every single last one of you. It means a great deal to me. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know... I, yes, I do want to get this chat channel monetized, and each and every one of you that subscribes gets me a little bit closer to that goal. Uh, when I do get to 1,000 subscribers, uh, and not finally, like, officially fully monetized, I, I'm planning on doing a little giveaway. Uh, shining related stuff that I've you know, that I've, I've got here. It's actually a couple of feet away from me. And that's my little way of saying thank you. But I, I need to get to a thousand subscribers first. I've already qualified for, uh, I don't even, it, like a partner program for YouTube. It's like the thing where under your video, you can, I guess, get tips or whatever. Like it's, it's a, what is it called? The super thanks. I call it a tip jar, but I mean, I know that's not what it's officially called. So now from this point onward, or like a couple of days, it, it's already been active. Uh, under each of my videos, you'll see a little thanks thing. And then you, if you want to, I'm not asking, but I'm saying it's there. If you want to do it, um, you can click on it and you know, leave me a little tip anywhere. And, <laughs> and they put like, you could put anywhere between $2 and like $500. I don't expect $500 from anybody, but you know, it's, it's a thing. Now I finally qualified for that. I don't know how I, I, I think they've lowered their standards. That's what YouTube did. They're desperate or, <laughs> or maybe a lot of people are complaining. I don't know. But, um, so I'm, I'm still, you know, still not completely monetized, but we're slowly and surely, hopefully getting there. Um, please, all of you, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the videos if you know anybody who might be interested in this. Uh, like I said, I'm working on my next installment of Understanding the Shining, and I'm gonna work on some stuff. I have finally located the blog that I've discussed in previous videos about the person who talked about, like, um, the theory that not just Danny has a Tony, uh, associated with him, like an imaginary friend that like all of them, all of the main characters, even Ullman and Watson, 
and and Halloran and the mom and the dad. Everybody has an imaginary friend. We just don't know their name. Uh, I finally located that blog and they've got some interesting stuff. I got to say, I don't agree with it all, but it is intriguing. It is very intriguing. And it's obvious that this person um, put in their work and like really, really thought about this stuff. So I will be showing you in upcoming videos and shouting that person out um, and, and what have you. Uh, I'm also, I want to talk about the damn monolith too. Um, and this video that you're listening to or watching right now is kind of the intro or the precursor to the video that I want to do about Stanley's monolith and what I personally think it means. But before I, you know, I got to tell you this story before I can tell you that one. So that's what's going on there. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, that black and white photo at the end of the movie, that enigmatic, mysterious uh, July 4th, 1921 photograph. I, I need to, I need to get into that and think about it. And I also need to do a video where I kind of just summarize, hopefully in a half hour or less, uh, like all of the things that I've been working on in these videos for the, over the, oh, the past year or so regarding this movie that I'm obsessed with. And, um, I don't know if I'll do like a bullet point list or heaven knows, heaven knows what, but maybe I'll do like a condensed 30 minute video of like all my main points that I've been working on in all of these shining videos. Uh, and then maybe I'll do like an even more condensed, like five minute version. I don't know. We shall see, but I need to get my shit together. You guys, I really do. Uh, there's so much information that I have been looking at and processing lately and, you know, um, I'm a little bit overwhelmed because when I research stuff about The Shining or anything really, like it's always a one thing leads to another kind of, uh, process or experience. That's why I go down like, I don't go down just one rabbit hole. Oh no. I, I go down like several of them all at the same time. So anyway, and this video, this video that you're watching now, this one I'm, I'm, uh, dedicating to Mr. Anno Domini. He sends me the most amazing stuff sometimes. And it's very thought provoking the things that he sends me. Today, um, I got a message from Anno, and he sent me a link to this thing, okay? This thing is called the Codex Serafin... Serafinianus, uh, originally published in 1981, is an illustrated encyclopedia of an imaginary world created by Italian artist, architect, and industrial designer Luigi Serafini between 1976 and 1978. It is approximately 360 pages, depending on edition, and written in an imaginary language. Okay. Uh, originally published in Italy, it has been released in several countries. Now, I hope I don't miss it. Yeah, this is like the picture of, I think it's volume one and volume two. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And Anno actually just sent me the archive.org link to the book so I could just read it online or look at it. It's not about reading, really. It's about looking at this thing. And let me just show that to you all right now. Look at this. Okay, check it out. This is it. This is the Codex Serafinianus. And it's 358 pages. And all these scribbles that you see, that is not an actual language. So don't worry about whether or not you can understand it. It's not meant to be understood like that. So the Co Codex Serafinianus, Luigi Serafini. Uh, check this thing out. I'm going to flip through it a little bit just so you could see it here. Right. Or should I? Oh, I hope this doesn't mess up my video. Okay, there it goes. So it's a little bit bigger. This look, they look similar, 
two letters that you and I are familiar with, but not really. Okay, this is mm, interesting now. This is just the first couple of pages. There's 358. Of course, I'm going to leave this in the um, description, the link to this and the link to its accompanying Wikipedia page. This is interesting. It's, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what Mr. Serafini was trying to accomplish with the publication, uh, the creation and the publication of this book. But here you go, right? Here you go. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more from the Wikipedia page about the book. And I just don't know what to think. I'm, I, 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 I mean, I'm, hmm, I'm kind of, kind of thinking that it might, I, I mean, I have my ideas about it for sure, for sure. This is, this looks like the stuff of nightmares. This looks like absolutely the stuff of nightmares. What the hell is this fish that, oh, it's a broom. Oh, Lord. Oh, good heavens. But let me go back to the Wikipedia page. So you can look at the whole thing on your own, in your own time. Uh, so anyway, it was, uh, I, I will leave the link in the description, like I said. Originally published in Italy, it has been released in several countries. Um, the Codex, this one, the Serafinianus, is an encyclopedia in manuscript with copious hand-drawn colored pencil illustrations of bizarre and fantastical flora, fauna, anatomies, fashions, and foods. It has been compared to the still undeciphered Voynich manuscript, and we're going to take a look at that too, uh, the story Clon, Ukbar, Orbus, Tertius, by José Luis, Luis Borges, and the artwork of uh, artwork of M. C. Escher, and the one that I covered in one of my videos recently, Hieronymus Bosch. Okay, um, I need to look this up too. Oh, uh, Borges, but some other time. Right, right now I'm just going to show you what I'm going to show you in this video. Uh, the illustrations are often surreal, like I just showed you with this here. Oh my goodness, um, parodies. They're often surreal parodies of things in the real world, such as a bleeding fruit, a plant that grows into roughly the shape of a chair and is subsequently made into one, and a copulating couple who metamorphose into an alligator. Others depict odd, apparently senseless machines, often with delicate appearances and bound by tiny filaments. Some illustrations are recognizable as maps or human faces, while others, especially in the quote-unquote physics chapter, are mostly or totally abstract. Nearly all of the illustrations are brightly colored and highly detailed. Yeah, I mean, I just showed you a couple. There's more. There's, oh my goodness, there's so many more. Like, what in the world is going on with this dude? Like, what is he? This is this, like, again, it, it does seem surrealist. It does remind me of, like, um, Dally and his contemporaries. Uh, or maybe even, you know, like a movie like uh, Chien, what what is the, uh, uh, Chien d'Andalus or something like that. Um, interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, what else does it say? <laughs> the false writing system appears modeled on Western writing systems with left to right writing in rows and an alphabet with uppercase and lowercase letters, some of which double as numerals. Some letters appear only at the beginning or end of words, uh, similar to Semitic writing systems. The curvilinear letters are rope or thread-like with loops and even knots, and are somewhat reminiscent of Sinhala script, which is a Sinhalese script, okay, used by the Sinhalese people and most Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka and elsewhere to write the Sinhala language, okay. Uh, in a talk at the Oxford University School of Bibliophiles on the 11th of May 2000, 
and 9, Serafini stated that there's no meaning behind the Codex's script, which is asemic, that his experience in writing it was similar to automatic writing, and that what he wanted his alphabet to convey was the sensation children feel with books they cannot yet understand, although they see what the writing that the writing makes sense for adults. Wow, that's interesting. Ah, yeah, yeah. However, the book's page numbering system was decoded by Alan C. Weschler and Bulgarian linguist Ivan Derzhansky and is a variation of base 21. Ooh, this is interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so, like, what is the point of producing a book like this? Again, Anno Domini sent me this today, or yesterday, really. Um, and I looked at it and I said, wow, this is interesting. This is extremely interesting. I don't know what's going on. Maybe that's the most interesting part. Like, like I just read, the aim of this is to give you, like, to take you back to that feeling of when you were a little child and you, before you learned how to read or write, and you just looked at books for the pictures. Remember that? Um... Interesting. And the writing, you know, to you anyway, was, didn't mean anything. And and you weren't, I mean, you could, your parents maybe knew how to read, but you weren't so much concerned with that as a child. But you knew that books were important because they were everywhere and people stared at them and, and whatever. Interesting. Really, really interesting, and I and this and uh, this book has been compared to um, the Voynich manuscript, which I will show you next. This is the Wikipedia page for the Voynich manuscript. Uh, it is an il illustrated codex, handwritten in an unknown script referred to as Voynichese. The vellum on which it is written has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, uh, 1404 to 1438. Stylistic analysis indicates it may have been composed in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. The origins, authorship, and purpose of the manuscript are debated. Hypotheses suggest that it is a script for a natural language or a constructed language an unread code, cipher, or other form of cryptography, or a meaningless hoax. Uh, the manuscript consists of around 240 pages, but there is evidence that pages are missing. Some pages are foldable sheets of varying sizes. Most of the pages have fantastical illustrations or diagrams, some crudely colored, with sections of the manuscript showing people fictitious plants, astrological symbols, etc. Uh, the text is written from left to right. The manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, a Polish-Lithuanian book dealer, who purchased it in 1912. Since 1969, it has been held in Yale University's uh, Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. The Voynich Manuscript has been studied by professional and amateur cryptographers, including American and British codebreakers from both World War I and World War II. Codebreakers Prescott Courier, William Friedman, Elizabeth Friedman, and John Tiltman were unsuccessful. The manuscript has never been demonstrably deciphered, and none of the proposed hypotheses have been independently verified. The mystery of its meaning and origin has excited the popular imagination, provoking study and speculation. In 2020, Yale University published the manuscript online in its entirety, 225 pages in their digital collections library, and I'm about to show it to you, just so you know what, what you know, what we're talking about here. 209 pages for this one that I found, uh, I guess from the late Yale University Library, but on archive.org, and this is what it looks like. I've seen pictures of it before online, but I, I you know, archive.org, archive, 
Okay, Archive is amazing. You can find stuff and look at stuff like this on Archive for free. Uh, it's accessible to you. You don't have to travel uh, to Yale University to look at this thing. It's right here on your screen. This is really quite something. Okay, and I mean, you're looking at this, th there's 209 pages that I cannot go through for you here, so I'm flipping through kind of quickly just so you can just get an idea of what this thing looks like on the inside. And again, you can go through this on your own, in your own time. I'm going to put the link in the description. And, um, you know, look at it, think about it, experience it, you know, don't, don't, Maybe don't really even worry about understanding it or trying to, at least at first. Just like, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy it for whatever it is that it, whatever this experience does for you. Looking at this book, looking at these pages, looking at these illustrations, thinking about them, uh, you know, imagining what could be going on here. It's pretty darn interesting. Pretty, 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 pretty darn interesting. Now, the Voynich Manuscript and uh, the Codex Seraphinianus that, um, that Anno sent me today, or no, Anno sent me the Codex Seraphinianus and then it reminded me of the Voynich Manuscript like a lot. And then that in turn reminded me of these or this, rather, illuminated manuscripts. Um, and yes, I'll read this to you a little, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, illuminated manuscripts, and I'll leave this this link in the description too, if you'd like to further educate yourself about what these are and what significance they have historically and religiously, specifically. Um, oh, they have miniature. Oh small oh never mind we're not doing that today uh, but an illuminated manuscript is a formally prepared document where the text is decorated with flourishes such as borders and miniature illustrations often used in the roman catholic church for prayers liturgical services and psalms the practice continued into secular texts from the 13th century onward and typically include proclamations, enrolled bills, laws, charters, inventories, and deeds. The earliest extant illuminated manuscripts come from the kingdom of the Ostrogoths and the Eastern Roman Empire and date from between 400 and 600 CE. Examples include the Codex Argent Argenteus and the Rosano Gospels, both of which are from the 6th century. Um, the majority of extant manuscripts are from the Middle Ages, although many survive from the Renaissance. I've actually held one from the Renaissance in my hands. Uh, these things are very well made. Let, let's just put it this way. Um, along with, uh, for survive from the Renaissance, along with a very limited number from late antiquity. Okay. And I, you can, you can probably figure out pretty quickly why there's such a limited number from late antiquity. Late antiquity was a long time ago. Um, while Islamic manuscripts can also be called illuminated and use essentially the same techniques, comparable Far Eastern and Mesoamerican works are described as painted. Most medieval manuscripts, illuminated or not, were written on parchment or vellum. And I think parchment is sheep's calves, and goats and vellum is um <laughs> animal skin like calf skin chiefly i think with vellum so yeah they're not using paper in these books they're using basically very thinly processed animal skin and that i know that sounds gross and it is but again if you like if you've ever if you ever have the opportunity to hold one of these things in, in your hands, and the one that I held in my hands was small. It was like the size of, like, um, like a little, little novelette, like that they, like beach reading kind of stuff. And 
the pages of this thing were so smooth and so strong. It wasn't like regular paper. Like regular paper, you can feel that it's fragile. And like if you make one wrong move, it'll tear. With like parchment or vellum, no. No, they're, they're very sturdy. And on top of that, when these illuminated manuscripts were made, um, the, the illustrations and the ink for the illustrations and the writing, the calligraphy and the decorations, they used good quality pigments that have lasted, obviously and literally, centuries. So anyway, like I said, most medieval manuscripts, illuminated or not, were written on parchment or vellum. Um, these pages were bound into books called codices, singular codex. A very few illuminated fragments also survive on papyrus. Books ranged in size from one smaller than a modern paperback, which is kind of the one that I was looking at, um, such as a pocket gospel, to very large ones such as choir books for choirs to sing from, and Atlantic Bibles requiring more than one person to lift them. Paper manuscripts appeared during the late Middle Ages. Very early printed books left spaces for red text known as rubrics. Rubrics? Oh, okay. All right. I gotta look that up later. Uh, miniature illustrations and illuminated initials, all of which would have been added later by hand. And that, I need to emphasize that too, they didn't have printing presses when they were making these. So each and every letter, each and every illustration, each and every thing that you see on the pages of books like these, whether they're big or small, was done by hand, painted with either a brush or a quill or whatever, by hand. Okay, drawings in the margins known as marginalia would also allow scribes to add their own notes, diagrams, translations, and even comic flourishes. The introduction of printing rapidly led to the decline of illumination. Illuminated manuscripts continued to be produced in the early 16th century, but in much smaller numbers, mostly for the very wealthy. They're making it sound like poor people could afford these like ever. No, they couldn't. Because, again, these were all handmade on extremely, well, yeah, I guess relatively expensive materials, like parchment, vellum, like the pigments. So these things were basically collector's items for either churches or extremely wealthy people or royalty, right? Um, they are among, they are among the most common items to survive from the Middle Ages. Many thousands survive. They are also the best surviving specimens of medieval painting and the best preserved. Indeed, for many areas and time periods, they are the only surviving examples of painting. Now, these books, these illuminated manuscripts, uh, like I said, some of them are Bibles, some of them are prayer books, Psalms, that kind of thing. Um, but each and every one was made because it was important and it costs money to make them. So most of them were made by monks working in places that were called, um, like, I guess monasteries that, you know, possibly specialize in this kind of thing. Like they were, they were called scriptoria, uh, because that is the place where these, these manuscripts were made and each, book was made by hand but not necessarily by just one person so like one person would i guess you know first they had to acquire the parchment or the vellum and then they had to do you know the lettering the the calligraphy the writing in there and then they had to do like the drawing just the whatever drawing for for the illustrations and then somebody else would come in and color the drawings for the illustrations so this was kind of a whole industry and again it was chiefly done by uh monks so people living in this in these monasteries during these medieval and gothic and and renaissance periods 
again before mostly before the invention of the printing press and these were designer items like if you think of designer um things or like unique things in the modern world you think of like designer clothing or custom-made shoes or custom-made clothes like couture or whatever it's called this was or or art or art that's that's one of art's big selling points still in the modern world that it's unique and if you buy an original like so and so like whatever artist you're talking about you buy it with more or less the guarantee if it's a painting or something like that i'm not talking about uh reproductions i'm not talking about lithographs or whatever other kind of print or works on paper but if you buy a painting done by such and such artist on a canvas or on a wooden board or what is anything like that like that's kind of part of the draw you know that you're the only one who has it and there's not another one like it anywhere on planet earth you've got the only one of its kind this is kind of also what was the draw with the illuminated manuscripts they cost a whole bunch of money so they were also at the time an example of what we now call conspicuous consumption which is basically like flaunting your wealth like uh if you buy a car you want people to know you want people to see that you drive sheesh a maserati or a ferrari or a porsche or whatever um if you like a lot of people if they buy designer clothing with labels yeah uh they want people to know that they're wearing gucci versace uh fendi or like whatever other designers there are or you know yves saint laurent or whatever whatever they're whatever they're wearing they want people to know i mean from what i've understood like the people who want you to know they're wearing designer clothing they're not those people they might have real good money but they're still not as rich as they wish they <laughs> were so like conspicuous consumption is still tied to people who again they might be pretty well to do but they still don't have it like that like that okay but that's another discussion for another time um but these illuminated manuscripts served that purpose at the time so having one if somebody had one or many of them some people just collected them and had had many of them made uh they wanted people to know about it and a lot of these people like these people who became dukes or whatever uh were basically illiterate so this wasn't about like reading or be, you're being able to say to your friends and acquaintances oh look at all these illuminated manuscripts i have i've read them all no it wasn't about reading them all or retaining the information inside of each one in a, in a lot of cases it was about just letting people know that you had them and that you know ergo you could afford to have them you 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 could afford to pay for them um you know think of your own analogy for the modern world as far as flaunting your wealth or your influence or whatever and illuminated manuscripts almost always not every all the time all the time but most of the time had to do with something religious again you know often used as it says here in the roman catholic church thanks to that organization we have illuminated manuscripts for better or for worse um so books in general at the time these these illuminated manuscripts and the way they were made they're kind of a snapshot of that time in history that tells us what was important to these people who were alive at the time i'll show you maybe one look at this various examples of illuminated manuscripts i Oh, this is from the Lombok brothers. Okay, look at this thing. There's not a lot of text on this particular page. There's a lot of, um, there's plenty of uh, illustrations, both larger and smaller. Doesn't tell you what size this thing is, 
um, are there morality tales going on here? Are they talking about religious things? Yes, they are, because, I mean, who could that be but like a priest or a bishop uh, in, in this part of the image? What is this building behind? Oh, well, it looks like a cathedral to me. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So, <sighs> this is this is very closely tied to religion. And the imagery you get from religion or imagery that in so one way or another is tied to religious ideas at this time in history in Europe you couldn't really have an image that wasn't tied connected to some kind of religious idea and again the religion of the day in that you know uh, location was Catholicism for better or for worse that's just what was going on and um let me show you like is this a carpet page i think it, i think it is right some of these you can actually read like if you know italian or french or or whatever you can actually like make out words in them some of them you can't because some of these um scripts that they used are basically ex extinct or dead languages like um I'll show you one it's that that also Anno told me about today and I mean I've, I I was aware of it but I had you know didn't really think about it for the longest time um you'll see it and it, it's written in basically an extinct way of writing called the glagolitic script but um look at this look at the detail look at the colors look at the attention to all these fine little lines and things like that and again not a lot at least on this page um not a lot of space for the words but plenty of space for all of these little embellishments and decorations and again every single last thing i'll just use this one as a quick example every single last item object thing that you see depicted on this page is connected to religion not just the picture of i mean i assume this is jesus here in in this central part maybe being lifted out of his tomb uh or no not lifted out but being placed into his tomb what am i saying and then he resurrects and then he you know walks on his own out out uh he exits the the tomb that there's this individual here is that mary is that some other saint one of the apostles i don't know but th these so these little bits here with the depictions of people with halos behind their heads that's very obviously religious and if you know what you're looking at you can identify you know who it is that they're depicting saint so and so or jesus or who you know whoever but it's these little things that you see the flowers the vines even these little bugs what the hell are they are they i are they cockroaches probably not cockroaches but something there's some kind of insect um to these little bugs all over the place is this a very toss kind of thing like all these pretty flowers but they all crawling with bugs is this supposed to remind you that you're mortal and that your time on earth is limited i don't know but it could mean anything um and each and every flower with this red one over here this blue one over here this yellow one over here the and the these these leaves and branches or vines or whatever you want to call this each each flower each little animal whatever these little bugs are they have some kind of religious significance i know that might be hard to believe but there are and there still exist you can still find them in libraries and what have you like encyclopedias dedicated to they're basically like reference manuals for religious imagery uh, this flower that flower you know apples oranges peaches uh pomegranates herbs spices um birds yeah all kinds of different animals both warm and cold-blooded uh, animals what there's a whole running list of of plants symbols whatever um 
and they all have an associated religious meaning. They can all be connected to some kind of religious idea. Again, specifically what kind of religious idea? We talked about it, Roman Catholicism. Uh, I don't know what those things are called, it, but, but it's basically like, you know, again, a reference uh, manual or an encyclopedia of sorts where you look up the item, whatever it happens to be, um, a flower, a plant, food, fruit, vegetables, fish, meat, wine, water, oil, whatever kind of flower, you name it. And you can find like what it means or what it could have meant or did mean in whatever context it was, it was used or it would have been used at that time in history. Okay. That's how detailed their system of uh, basically organizing religious imagery and, and its associated ideas was. So uh, that's why I believe I'm not that far off the mark when I'm doing like my little um, whatever when I when I when I'm going through the shining or eraser head or twin peaks or what have you. Uh, because this has been around for quite a while. I did a video long time ago, several months ago, like shortly after I started this channel, where I talked about Erwin Panofsky. Look him up. Or look up that video. I think I was talking about it in the context of um, an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. It's called The Sign of Satan. Uh, it's in there. Go ahead, find it. It's in there. Now, I, I, why, why am I talking so much about this? Why am I talking so much about this? Because illuminated manuscripts were the internet and social media of their day. All right? So the ideas that the, these people lived by at the time, and yes, I'm, I may, you know, this is the mainly centered on the upper classes. This is not the peasants. This is not the people who were just trying to eke out an existence and, you know, whatever, you know, f um, f playing whatever role they played in like the feudalist system or whatever. No, 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 no. These are the upper classes. They were the ones who could afford the shit, but they were the ones who set trends and they still are. Not much has changed in that regard. So when you see things in advertising, in movies, in music, in whatever, and if, in my opinion, if you believe that these are products of uh, the working class, ever, think again. Think again. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think that Stanley and David Lynch are trying to combat each in their own special way. Uh, so images are extremely important. Images are extremely important. Art, we call, you know, I say images, images, pictures, art are extremely important for shaping your perception of the world. And that has been the case since I keep saying this over and over and over again. That has been the case since day one. Even before writing and literacy was a thing in the Stone Age, during prehistoric times. Those cave paintings, they're there for a reason. They're a form of communication. Okay? Something about human beings, something about whatever it is that we do, we feel compelled as a species to communicate visually and pictorially. Why? I don't know. I I can't answer that question. I don't think I'll ever be able to answer the why of, of that issue. But it it's a thing. It's a thing that you can't ignore. It's something that isn't going away. Religions have tried to ban imagery of whatever kind. And I suppose it does work to an extent, but it only works to an extent in that particular context outside of it you're still going to find art and images and whatever now again i, sh I showed you the codex seraphinianus again 
uh, thank you so much, Anno Domini. I, ta I showed you the Voynich manuscript and their accompanying links to archive.org where you can look at the whole thing, the whole thing, if you want to. And I'm going to take a quick little coffee break of my own and I'm going to show you the other one that Anno sent me today or yesterday, the Codex Gigas, okay, the giant book. Okay, and then I'll get into like what I really want to talk about. <laughs> So, hold on. I'll be right back. Okay, now I'm back. Um, and again, I want to cover this one too because Anno sent it to me. I've been aware of it before, but I've never really taken the time to, like, take a better look at it. Um, this is the Codex Gigas, uh, also known as the Giant Book, or that's the translation in English. It is the largest extant medieval illuminated manuscript in the world at a length of 92 centimeters or 36 inches. Uh, very large illuminated Bibles were a typical feature of Romanesque monastic book production. But even within this group, the page size of the Codex Gigas is noted as exceptional. The manuscript is also known as the Devil's Bible due to its highly unusual full-page portrait of Satan and the legend surrounding its creation. Okay. Um, the manuscript was created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine monastery of Podlajice in Bohemia, now a region in the modern-day Czech Republic. The manuscript contains the complete Vulgate Bible, as well as other popular works, all written in Latin. Between the Old and New Testaments are a selection of other popular medieval reference works, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, and the Bello Judaico, um, Isidore of Seville's Encyclopedia Etymologiae, uh, the Chronicle of Cosmas of Prague, uh, and medical works, uh, an early version of the Ars Medicinae, a compilation of treatises and two books by Constantine the African, eventually finding its way to the Imperial Library of Rudolf II in Prague. The entire collection was taken as spoils of war by the Swedes in 1648 during the Thirty Years' War, and the manuscript is now preserved in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm, where, is, where it is on display for the general public. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I guess this thing is most well known for this image, the illustration of the devil, uh, folio 290 recto. Uh, <laughs> Look at this thing. <laughs> this is crazy, right? This is, I mean, they, I, I don't know if this is just an interpretation. Are they just saying that this is an image of the devil? Or, um, you know, or, or is it a demon or, or something like that? I'm not sure. It looks... To us now, it lo this looks like a ridiculous cartoon, but at the time, it might very well have been terrifying. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Um, folio, uh, no, 290 recto, otherwise empty, includes a picture of the devil, about 50 centimeters or 20 inches tall. Directly opposite the devil is a full-page de full depiction of the kingdom of heaven thus juxtaposing contrasting images of good and evil. The devil is shown frontally, crouching with arms uplifted in a dynamic posture. He is clothed in a white loincloth with small, comma-shaped red dashes. I would assume that those are drops of blood, but what do I know? Um, these dashes have been interpreted as the tails of ermine furs, a common symbol of sovereignty. Well, that's interesting. He has no tail, and his body, arms, and legs are of normal human proportions. His hands and feet end with only four fingers and toes each, terminating in large claws. Both his claws and large horns are red. He has a large dark green head, and his hair forms a skull cap of dense curls. I mean, if you ever watch The Simpsons, 
That's <laughs> that's what Ned Flanders says to one of or both of his sons, that they have the devil's curly hair. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought of when I read that. Anyway, the eyes are small with red pupils, and his red-tipped ears are large. His open mouth reveals his small white teeth, and two long red tongues protrude from the corners of his mouth. Uh, the doubling of tongues evokes negative association with serpents, which have forked tongues, uh, a metaphoric reference to dishonest human beings. The expression forked tongues is an ancient one and is found in the Bible. Uh, several pages before this double spread are written in yellow characters on a blackened parchment and have a very gloomy character, somewhat different from the rest of the Codex. The reason for the variation in coloring is that the pages of the Codex are of vellum. Vellum, or scraped and dried animal hide, tans when exposed to ultraviolet light. Over centuries, the pages that were most frequently turned have developed this telltale darker color. Okay. Um, <sighs> this, this is a very interesting one because it has like this lore associated with it. It was made by somebody, allegedly, somebody who allegedly existed at this time in history, I guess in the year 1222, uh, named Herman the Recluse who, in the Benedictine monastery of Podlajice, near uh, Chorudim in the Czech Republic. The monastery was destroyed sometime in the 15th century during the Hussite Revolution. Records in the Codex end, end, end. That doesn't mean that's when they started making it. It means that's when they stopped making it or adding to it in the year 1222. Shortly after it was written, it was pawned by the Benedictines to the Cistercian monks of the Sedlik Monastery, where it remained for 70 years. Uh, the Benedictine Monastery in Brevnov reclaimed the Bible around the end of the 13th century. All right. This is interesting. This is very, very, very interesting. Again, um... what is going on and i have and I have this for you a link for you and this is the page that i that i wanted you to see this is the link it's very very what should i call it peculiar that heaven is depicted as basically a city like a city of this a medieval looking city i don't know what to think about that but whatever so, moving on from this, I want to go to what I what I really wanted to talk about today. This thing. The Red Book by Carl Jung, or Liber Novus, uh, is a red leather-bound folio manuscript crafted by the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung between 1914 and about 1930. It recounts and comments upon the author's psychological experiments between 1913 and 1916, and is based on manuscripts, journals, known as Black Books, first drafted by Jung in 1913 through 1915 and 1917. Despite being nominated as the central work in Jung's oeuvre, it was not published or made otherwise accessible for study until... 2009. In October 2009, with the cooperation of Jung's estate, the Red Book was published by W. W. Norton in a facsimile edition, complete with an English translation, three appendices, and over 1,500 editorial notes. Editions and translations in several other languages soon followed. In December 2012, Norton additionally released a reader's edition of the work this smaller format edition includes the complete translated text of the Red Book, along with the introduction and notes prepared by Sonu Shamdasani, but it omits the facsimile reproduction of Jung's, Jung's original calli calligraphic manuscript. While the work has in past years been described 
descriptively called simply the Red Book, Jung did emboss a formal title on the spine of his leather-bound folio. He titled the work Liber Novus, Latin for New Book. His manuscript is now increasingly cited as Liber Novus, and under this title implicitly includes draft material intended for but never finally transcribed into the red leather folio proper. This is interesting because a lot of people, there's a lot of talk on the internet about the red book you see on Ullman's desk in The Shining, along with other red books. It's not just that book, but being uh, Kubrick's possible reference to this very thing by Carl Jung, The Red Book. I don't know what to think. Because, as you can see, it says here, this thing wasn't published before October 2009. All right, and this, was it ever meant to be published? That's my question. Because it looks like it was his journal. Or like this little thing he was working on. Maybe in his spare time. Maybe as some kind of art therapy. Or I don't know. I, I really don't know. And I'm just like, those are just guesses on my part but um like it says here it's based on manuscripts journals known as black books what does that mean like did he ever did he ever want to publish these or were they just his notes that he never meant anybody to see or like I don't know what's going on with this book and why is there so much I, I don't understand um, like the hype surrounding this thing but this too is on archive.org there it is I will definitely leave the description in uh, the description no 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 the link in the description check this out check this out okay it's 404 pages and you will see very quickly why this thing caught my attention and why I decided look at this why I decided to include this in today's presentation regarding these mysterious illuminated manuscripts um, some of them you know not like um, the Serafini Serafinianus it's not fake. It's it's the work of a designer, artist, architect, designer named Luigi Serafini. But obviously, he's trying to mimic whatever was going on with illuminated manuscripts and and books like that from this uh, this this time period many centuries ago. Why was he trying to? imitate that that's the same like the talk about the Voynich manuscript is that it's a fake there's you know they're saying maybe this thing is really this mysterious language that nobody knows anymore or whatever or a secret language or maybe it's just a fake maybe this is what I guess one of the fold-out pages um, and oh Lord and like if it's a fake why if it's real, why? If it's fake, why? Um, and of course, I covered illuminated manuscripts and what importance they held for the people who were alive during the time when these things were contemporary. These meant everything. Like you got your religious education through these, um, your you know con uh, rules and regulations for conduct. All kinds of stuff was in these manuscripts, uh, these very expensive ones and not so expensive ones or less expensive ones. These things were kind of what set the standards for their day. Just think of a young woman in the recent past, like reading Vogue magazine and studying those images of the models in both the pictorial spreads uh, for the articles in the magazine and the advertising for various products usually meant for uh, beautifying oneself uh, makeup clothing shoes handbags um, diet products exercise products 
uh, furniture, you name it, and studying those pictures. I know because I used to be one of those girls. I'm from a time before the internet, and I remember just devouring fashion magazines or, you know, just pop culture stuff in magazine form. And I can imagine that whatever these people were doing at the time, this was their version of that. And before the internet, before Instagram and, you know, Photoshop and, you know, all these celebrities basically making themselves look, making their bodies and, and their faces and whatever basically look impossible with the modern technology, the modern photo manipulation we have now. Um, you know, before any of that talk about how detrimental that is to young people or, or whatever, they were having that same conversation in the 80s and 90s about fashion magazines and airbrushing and stuff like that. But, you know, this this isn't quite the same. This has to do with behavior, what's expected of you, what you should know about religious things and how they relate to everything else. This is your, basically, textbook on how to be a proper person at that time in history in that place, that location, right? So here comes Carl Jung with this thing. And what, what did it say here? When did he start doing this? Uh, between 1914 and 1930. So about 16 years he worked on this thing, 404 pages, and not uh, 404 of these pages are not all his uh, writing. And he did this, allegedly. Um, he actually sat down with these pieces of parchment or vellum or whatever he was using in the ink. And he did all of these little drawings and he did all of this writing, this calligraphy. Um, I'm, you know, I don't know for sure. Is it in German or in Latin? I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked it in, into it that closely, but just like, so that was Liber Primus. This is Liber Secundus. Um, what the hell is going on with this book? And why do people... I'm just going to go ahead and ask the question openly out loud. Why do people take it seriously? Is this a spoof? Is this Jung's spoof of illuminated manuscripts and everything they meant at the time when they were being made? And the kind of influence that the written word has on people, for better or for worse, and all of the associated um, kind of assumptions that go along with language and art and what have you. Is that what he's doing here? I don't know. But, you know, I don't know whether or not Stanley Kubrick was aware of this thing. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But if he was aware of this thing, what and he featured it in The Shining, you know, most prominently on Ullman's desk in the interview scene in the office. You see that red book. And yes, we, you know, you find out that's not the Young's red book. That's just a hotel uh, manual for whatever, whatever at the time. Like some, I guess a, a version of the yellow pages for hotels or red pages or just a red book for hotels. But why is it there? Again, I don't believe that Stanley does anything um, just because. It's there because he wants you to see it. That's why it's there. And why does he want you to see it? Does he expect the average viewer of his movie to be aware of both Carl Jung and Carl Jung's Red Book and stuff like this and stuff like this and stuff like this and illuminated manuscripts and how important they are as far as the development of art and ideas and what have you i don't know i can't answer that question but here is here this is these images these illustrations i haven't really like looked into it i've got to say because i kind of didn't want to look into it i didn't want to have anything um contaminate my reaction to this when I show it to you in this video, but like, where the hell is this coming from? What is this? 
for this one for example what in the world i see an axe i see a double-headed axe well that's interesting um and a man with some kind of headdress or helmet that has horns on it oh shit <laughs> i mean you know this is page 35 if if you if you want to look at this later in your own time like what is going on what in the world is going on Again, I'm not very familiar with this, so I don't, I, I'm pretty sure that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I wanted to explore it and show it to you, kind of like my real immediate reaction to it, without, again, without reading about it, without researching or looking stuff up. I wanted to just kind of see it and, and see it with fresh eyes while you listen to me reacting to it. Is this some, I mean, is sarcasm like an option with this kind of thing? We take this seriously because we take Carl Jung seriously. But what if he was having a little fun in his own way? And, you know, maybe having fun doing these drawings or paintings or whatever on these pages um, and writing out this stuff here in, I mean, doing calligraphy like this is work. It t this shit takes time. And he devoted however many hours, however much time to this for a reason. Was this an art project? Was the Red Book much more an art project than it was like a literary work or um, something that can be counted as, as one of his publications regarding uh, psychoanalysis or whatever? I don't know. I do not know, but something tells me that there is possibly um, a good dose of irony going on here. Y'all let me know in the comments. And the, the, so everything I've, I've been talking about in this video has been leading up to this. Why, why the Red Book? Why is it so popular? Why does it intrigue so many people so very much? Again, is it just because Carl Jung was who Carl Jung was? Or do they, do people believe that he's like encoded some kind of secret knowledge in this thing? Or like what's going on? Oh, here, it looks like a devil picture. Mm, interesting. And again, there's, this is the picture of the uh, devil in the uh, Codex Gigas. Now, again, Look, I mean, and I say it's a devil because it looks like it has horns. I could be wrong. Um, what the hell is this? And again, is this part of his, is this his illustration? In the, these various illustrations, is this his example of how dream symbolism can work? What in the world? What in the world? I don't know what to think about this. I really don't. But... I mean, and if this thing wasn't published before 2009 and only rumors of its existence uh, is, is what people had to work with at the time, is that what Stanley is referring to? Or does, I mean, like how much did, how much did Stanley Kubrick know about this? And if that all, I mean, if that's the case, if Stanley Kubrick was aware of this thing, even though it wasn't published, and available for view by the general public in any way, shape, or form before the year two thousand and nine. Um, but if he, if if he's possibly referring to this book, and not just this book, but Carl Jung in general, by the inclusion of the Red Book in Ullman's office, um, what does that mean? What does that mean? What is Stanley possibly trying to say? by alerting his viewer to the existence of this, possibly alerting his viewer to the existence of this thing, this red book, by the very, very famous and celebrated Carl Jung. Yeah? Okay, so this is where, like, they translate it and you can read the stuff um, from this page onward. You know, his his writings, his calligraphy. Yeah, on the other pages with whatever. Like, I, I don't have time for that. Of course not. But like I said, why is Stanley possibly 
possibly showing us um, Carl Jung in the form of um, of the Red Book. And here's a picture of the Red Book resting on Jung's desk. Interesting. Interesting. Now, Carl, this is what I'm looking at here is Carl Jung's page uh, from Wikipedia, right? Uh, go ahead and read through this in your own time because I've already gone over an hour. I'm sorry, that's just what I do. Uh, and so what's one of the things that Carl Jung is very well known for? Um, I was just there. Archetypes. And there's a whole other article on Jungian archetypes. And yes, I was looking for arch here in the control F because I, 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 I think that the discussion about the Red Book is largely a discussion about whether or not he was presenting more of his famous archetypes or adding to the discussion about that or just expanding on it or whatever. So what is an archetype? It says right here, this is a very nice handy dandy couple of paragraphs about it. The archetype is a concept borrowed from anthropology to denote a process of nature. Jung's definitions of archetypes varied over time and have been the subject of debate as to their usefulness. Archetypal images, also referred to as motifs in mythology, are universal symbols that can mediate opposites in the psyche, are often found in religious art, mythology, and fairy tales across cultures. Jung saw archetypes as pre-configurations in nature that give rise to repeating, understandable, describable experiences. In addition, the concept takes into account the passage of time and the patterns resulting from transformation. Archetypes are said to exist independently of any current event or its effect. They are said to exert influence both across all domains of experience and throughout the stages of each individual's unique development, uh, being in part based on her her heritable uh, physiology. They are thought to have existed, quote unquote, existed, since humans became a differentiated species. They have been deduced through the development of storytelling over tens of thousands of years, indicating repeating patterns of individual and group experience, behaviors, and effects across the planet, apparently displaying common themes. The concept did not originate with Jung, but with Plato, who first conceived of primordial patterns. Later contributions came from Adolf Bastian and Hermann Usener, among others. In the first half of the 20th century, it proved impossible to objectively isolate and categorize the notion of an archetype within a materialist frame. According to Jung, there are as many archetypes as there are typical situations in life, and he asserted that they have a dynamic mutual influence on one another. Their alleged presence could be extracted from thousand-year-old narratives, from comparative uh, religion and mythology. Jung elaborated many archetypes in the archetypes and the collective unconscious and in Aion, uh, researches into the phenomenology of the self. Examples of archetypal, or, I'm sorry, examples of archetypes might be the shadow, the hero, the self, anima, animus, mother, father, child, and trickster. Okay. I mean, obviously, this is not an exhaustive um, discussion of this idea or this concept or whatever. They they have a separate page just on Jungian. I said Jungian, Jungian archetypes. They have a whole page. I I, I bet it's a long one. Um, and even here, they cannot. Um, they cannot. Uh, oh Lord, no, they cannot, uh, they cannot, um, exhaust everything that could be said about this 
uh, subject. Okay, so what's going on? What's going on with this? And specifically, I'm thinking about this in relation to Kubrick and The Shining and possibly his other movies. What is going on? Is there something wrong with this? Is there something that needs to be explored about this? Why is this? Con it, I mean, I'm not really necessarily questioning it. But I'm curious about it. Why is this accepted more or less as canon? And what does that mean to us, to human beings? What does that mean to art and the way it's used? How oppressive is this? If it is oppressive at all. Because to me, personally, it looks like the authors of these kinds of things, one of them is Jung, um, they seem to have delineated the parameters of thinking. What you can and can't do, what you can and can't think about, what's possible in the realm of understanding with regard to human beings. And how we think and how, you know, language and whatever, how we use it, where it comes from. Um, and we're basically limited. We are extremely limited in our understanding of the world precisely because of things like uh, these, whatever, archetypes. Either not identified by Jung, but it says here by Plato. He, 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 he did it before Jung. So that makes me even more suspicious. Why? Why does the world, or did these people, both in the beginning of the 20th century and, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries ago, why do they see a need to organize the world into these categories? And what are those categories based on? And what does that mean for everybody? For life, for culture, for what have you, everything. And how, how does it limit us? Or does it limit us? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And if Stanley is referring to this thing, where's those pictures? Uh, you know, this book in general, the, the, uh, oh golly, the uh, red book in The Shining. Is he taking it seriously? Or is he saying that he's using, maybe Stanley is fighting fire with fire in The Shining. And when I say fire with fire, I mean, you know, he's fighting archetypes with archetypes. Maybe that's what's going on in The Shining. If, again, once again, this is a huge if, if we can even begin to assume that Kubrick was using archetypes at all, or whether or we, we can assume that he was referring to this, at the time, um, mysterious book that nobody had ever seen before, but maybe they had heard about with regard to Carl Jung, the Red Book. I'm going to do some digging. I sure am. But this is, I needed to make this video to kind of, again, um, lay the groundwork for what I want to work on next time or in the next couple of videos. I want to talk about that damn monolith. And I know everybody thinks that the monolith is a movie screen in a theater. I've heard that argument before. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. I have my own reasons for not agreeing with it. For me, it just seems a little too convenient. It seems like too simple, too easy. Oh yeah, you know, that's the answer. That's what the monolith is. It's the same dimensions as a movie screen. Like when, though? 
in what part of history? Because like movie screens haven't always been ex the exact same um, measurements or proportions or whatever. So like, is it a movie screen from like when movies first started being a thing? Or is it a movie screen from the 1960s or the 1950s or whatever? I don't know. I have my own ideas. Um, again, I think that, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're studying or when you're getting your education through, uh, watching Stanley Kubrick movies, he's not going to make it easy for you. Trust and believe he's going to make you, make you like do the work and you're, and he's not going to ask you, he's not going to give you assignments. He's not going to give you homework. He's not going to give you exams. No, you're going to have to like, uh, design your own curricula and then pursue it in your own way. Um, which is kind of, you know, the magic of, of Stanley Kubrick movies and the learning experience that you can, uh, find there if you choose to do so. So, you know, I've thrown a bunch of ideas out here in this video. I don't know what all of this means. I'm not going to pretend. And that's another video I need to make. I am sick and tired of the debunkers. I am sick and tired. And I've expressed this to Tankard. I've expressed this to Gershom and Dr. Luke and who else? I'm not sure. But I am sick and tired of the debunkers. I am sick and tired of the gatekeepers. I am sick and tired of the high priests of Kubrickology. Like I called it, you know, the cult of the shining. Um, in one of my old videos, but I need to like rework that because there's something going on with this movie, with Kubrick in general. And there's like, there's like a bunch of gatekeepers and they all seem to believe the same thing. It's like a religion or a cult or whatever. They all seem to believe the same thing and don't you dare challenge the orthodoxy don't you dare try to come up with a new idea because they they're, they're going to send out like you know talked about the dorothy theory the other day from i think who was it qwz 180 like they're going to send out their flying monkeys to stop you i mean I know that sounds insane, but like, it, or th it doesn't happen that way, literally, but like the gatekeepers themselves are possibly the flying monkeys. I don't know, but you can't, you can't try to think of this movie in a different way or in an original way, or just like, j again, like an uh, uh, unusual way. You have to think of it the way that qualified experts think of it and the qualified experts are s self-appointed. How did that happen? And why? Well, and I've seen so many debunk articles and videos and whatever. And I'm like, I, 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 whenever I see something like that, I think to myself, like, what, what you trying to do? To you know, the person who's doing the debunking or whatever, what you trying to do? Stop people from having ideas? That's unconscionable and detestable and despicable. You can't have an idea unless it's the same idea as the one I have. And in either case, I'm not going to acknowledge that you're having ideas too. No, it's just me. You know, th this is, this is how the gatekeepers feel. Mm. No, that's got to go. This has to be inclusive. This has to be a learning experience that everybody can take something from it, whatever it is that, that, that helps them or suits them. And it can't be censored. It can't be, you know, this is not a football game. This is not a soccer game. There's no such thing as an offside. Okay? No, we're all learning from this, each in our own special way. And we kind I mean, the productive thing would be to encourage each other. So I might make a video about that, something, you know, exploring that um, a little more. I don't know. We shall see. 
So I've done everything I can do with this video. Um, this is going to, I'm going to continue with this in a future video discussing possibly the association that I've seen other people try to make between this year, what I'm talking about here, with the Red Book, with Carl Jung, with his archetypes, and that damn monolith. Ugh. Something's going on. Again, Stanley wants us to think. He wants us to think. Because if we don't, we're all doomed. So there's that, and, and that's kind of, I, I'm, I think I'm kind of done with whatever it is I was trying to do in this video. I still don't know. I still don't know, yo. But that's that. So I'll reiterate the church announcements. Uh, returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you would like to. Um, and that's that. Let me, and I can't wait for the comments. Drop some comments. Um, it doesn't really matter if you agree with me. I love reading your ideas. I love seeing whether or not whatever I'm doing here is, is inspiring people to just have thoughts, have ideas of whatever kind. Um, that's my goal. Not to tell you what to think, not to tell you how to think, but I just want you to think. That's it. That's it. I want you to look, look at things, and think about them. That's it. Really. So, y'all, I think I've done, yeah, like I keep saying, I think I've done what I could with this video. I'm going to have to maybe possibly edit this a little bit. I had a couple of glitches. So, that's it for now. And I'm working on episode 17 of Understanding the Shining, and a bunch of other stuff. I've had so many ideas lately. So until next time, until I find yet another reason to talk at you in one of these videos, I will go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So bye-bye, everybody.